Well, every 16 seconds, someone in the United States sustains a traumatic brain injury. It's caused by a blow or a jolt to the head, potentially leading to lifelong challenges. Tonight, we begin our three-part series, Surviving TBI, a first-hand account. Over the next three days, we'll take a look inside the lives of three Humboldt County residents living with a traumatic brain injury as they continue to beat the odds one moment at a time. Six years ago, Noah Lertz lived the life of a typical 12-year-old boy. He loved playing sports, did well in school. Then one day, while walking home, a careless driver got too close. A car window smacked the back of my head. I just thought, well, he's just been dinged. He'll be okay. But reality quickly set in, and Noah's family soon realized that what he had suffered was a traumatic brain injury, or TBI. I had no idea what they were talking about. I'd never heard the term before. It was all brand new to me. It can happen to anyone at any time. It knows no boundaries. It has no limitations to the challenges it brings. I am no longer able to easily walk around. Slowly I began to realize that he wasn't going to just wake up one day and, and be okay again. A difficult reality for anyone to accept. Angela Zinsky, now 30, sustained her traumatic brain injury 14 years ago after falling asleep at the wheel and crashing head-on into a semi. Like I almost don't even remember who I used to be. It was somebody else. I have a different mind now. I think different, I smell different, taste different. It's like starting life over again. Jeff Ratzlaff started his life over 13 years ago. We hit a concrete wall, I think they said 60 miles an hour. Everything that's happened has intensified all my feelings towards everything very much. And emotional changes are just one of the many challenges Jeff and others living with TBI are forced to face. Join us tomorrow night for part two of Surviving TBI, a first-hand account, as we look at the everyday struggles Jeff, Noah, and Angie deal with as a result of their traumatic brain injuries. Currently, 5.3 million Americans are living with a traumatic brain injury. Last night, we introduced you to three survivors living right here in Humboldt County. Tonight, as we continue our series, Surviving TBI, a first-hand account, we show you just a few of the daily challenges they deal with as a result of their traumatic brain injuries. Since Jeff Ratzlaff sustained his traumatic brain injury 14 years ago, seizures have become a daily part of life. He's suffered hundreds since the accident and for the first eight years had to take nearly 7,000 milligrams of medication every day just to minimize their effects. They said it was more than they'd seen other people have to take. So in 2001, Jeff came here to the Humboldt Neurology Group to meet with Dr. John Gambin about implanting a device called the Vagus Nerve Stimulator which would significantly reduce his need for medication and help control his daily seizure outbreaks. We put electrical stimulation into the vagus nerve that then sends the messages up into the brainstem and tends to uh, then regulate these excitable circuits. But for those living with TBI, facing only one disability as a result of the injury is nearly unheard of because when the skull is initially impacted, different regions of the brain that control different bodily functions can be severely damaged. Short-term memory is usually one of them. A client once told me that it's like opening up a door to a room and throwing all the files of your memory into that room. It's there, but you can't access it. Even just around the house, he will not remember something from moment to moment. He has to have somebody that's uh, there to remind him of everyday, everyday things that we all take for granted. Now Jeff has to write everything down from important appointments to the names of his friends. I remember their faces, no problem, but I can't remember the names. For many others, it's the loss of mobility that impacts their daily routines. I only use one arm now, and I've learned to do everything. It's harder, but I don't use the arm, and my leg, I limp. But disabilities like these don't keep Angie or the others from having hope and chasing their goals. Join us tomorrow night for part three of Surviving TBI, a first-hand account as we take a look at the recovery process and how all three TBI survivors are moving on. 
This year, approximately 1.4 million people will sustain a traumatic brain injury in the United States. Of those, 50,000 will die and 235,000 will be hospitalized. This week, we've taken a look inside the lives of three Humboldt County residents living with a traumatic brain injury and introduce you to some of the challenges they're faced with every day. Tonight, as we conclude our series, Surviving TBI, a first-hand account, we take a look at the recovery process and how all three TBI survivors are moving on. From the moment a traumatic brain injury occurs, the clock begins to tick. If you don't get to that in time and decompress the, uh, the pressure and the bleeding, the person will die. Doctors say the first 48 hours are crucial when the buildup of blood and cerebral spinal fluid fill the skull. The bruised brain has no room to expand, causing oxygen levels to drop. That was the big issue. Yeah. The first week it was his pressure. They just kept talking about, oh, this is getting way too elevated. The longer the pressure goes untreated, the harder it is for the brain to repair itself. And you realize that that's really what they're saying is the longer this continues, the less chance there is for a better prognosis. But once medical treatment has been received and a prognosis given, all you can do is wait and rely on hope to do the rest. Put your energy into moving forward, not into why. If you put your time into why, um, you're spinning your wheels. Folks are told that they aren't going to recover. They're told that there's always going to be limitations. And I've seen that it's, it's not true. I've seen that people do recover for a lifetime. A lifetime filled with new beginnings. I had a daughter, and I've worked. I'm, I've got a CR. I'm, I'm going on. And she's not alone. Jeff and Noah also continue to progress, with friends and family by their side, actively participating in a life they almost lost. Meanwhile, making headway, a local center for brain injury recovery and collaboration with Traumatic Brain Injury Services of California, Med in Eureka for TBI Changes Everything, a conference centered on those affected by traumatic brain injury. Experts from throughout the West Coast led today's conference, speaking on topics such as brain injuries resulting from everyday incidents like falls or motor vehicle accidents to soldiers who've sustained a traumatic brain injury from combat. Clinical neuropsychologist Dr. Diane Ziner, who works directly with Iraq War veterans within the VA healthcare system in Palo Alto, says 65 percent of all combat-related injuries are caused by improvised explosive devices, 60 percent of which result in mild to severe TBI. Severe refer to the amount of time that someone's unconscious. So that in fact, although you can have a mild TBI, it means you've been unconscious less than 30 minutes. But what seems to be most alarming is the amount of troops returning from combat with a traumatic brain injury that are not diagnosed. As many as eight to 10,000 people have, are undiagnosed head injury and have been discharged home. If you'd like more information on traumatic brain injury, you can go to our website and click on the Making Headway link, or the number's gonna come up here. You can call Making Headway at the number on your screen at 707-442-7668.